I think it's it's 3.30, 3.31 in fact. So um, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for attending um, this Zoom session. Um, and today we are very, very fortunate to have um, the sort of the main author of the Malaysian guidelines for this. Um, he's, he's taken time off from a very, very busy schedule um, to be with us and sort of discuss the Malaysian perspective on the treatment guidelines um, and enlighten us how things have probably changed from uh, what we learned in, in March um, to what we're learning now. Um, Dr. Suresh is a senior consultant um, in Hospital Sungai Bulo and also the head of the Department of Medicine there. Um, and he was also a, a key influencer in um, the ID fraternity in Malaysia um, and a mentor to many of us. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Suresh. Uh, thanks, Th thanks, Gary. Um, I think, uh, can you can you see my slides? Yep. Yes, and you can. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I think um, uh, what I'll do is I will um, I'll quickly go through uh, uh, what I know about COVID. Now I think you you guys are the experts in COVID uh, compared to me. I came to uh, I came to Tawau to learn COVID. Okay. So uh, first first go through SARS um, some some basics about SARS just just to keep keep ourselves. Um, up to date. And so now, the, initially, when we started uh, our COVID work, we thought it's purely a respiratory illness. Now we know, now we know otherwise, um, that um, it is beyond respi it's beyond respiratory illness. Now, uh, it, in addition to cough, shortness of breath, it can also cause fatigue and uh, body aches. It can also cause loss of taste and smell. And I think I think um, um, in this, this search, we found this quite useful because patients were able to tell us, doctor, from that day onwards, I lost my smell, or that day onwards, I lost my taste. Uh, the, the difference between this and the URTI symptom normally is the loss of taste and loss of smell is sudden onset and is absolute. They cannot taste anything or they cannot smell anything. They also can GI symptoms, so we, we do see patients with diarrhea. And so it has got a whole varied um, a symptomatology as we have learned now for COVID, right? It's, it's not just respiratory. Um, with regards to incubation periods, um, um, even though we say 14 days, uh, 14 days, uh, uh, the mean incubation period is 5.2 days. By 95% of them uh, would have got uh, would have got the disease by about seven days based on this Chinese study. Uh, the another another uh, uh, study outside Hubei province again similar by by about six days, 95% of them will, will have got um, um, uh, disease. Even though we keep as 14 days, now we think majority would have got their symptoms by end of one week. And so you will see that, you know, uh, our incubation period will slowly shorten as, as days go by, as we know more. Uh, mode of transmission, uh, we think it is primarily by droplet transmission, meaning uh, uh, droplet transmission, that means if you wear a mask and I also wear a mask, uh, the transmission can be stopped. Um, uh, in some occasions, it will be airborne. Uh, that will happen if it's an enclosed space. So if uh, in our pantries and in our changing rooms and in our, in our, in our uh, Bilix Mayang, I think it can be airborne if, uh, if, if people don't, uh, if too many people are staying in those spaces. It can be airborne, and so what I mean by airborne means it can stay in the in the in the um, air for a while, and the next person comes in after a while can also get infected. And so in enclosed spaces, it can be airborne. If you have a prolonged exposure to respiratory particles, often when I'm shouting or singing or exercising, again it can be airborne. And so, especially in these situations. Um, uh, you, 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 you either stay in a place where it's well ventilated, so best done out, outdoors, or there has to be, you have to wear a mask, uh, otherwise it can be airborne. And again, the role of ventilation is important. And so uh, you should avoid staying in places where there is very poor ventilation. And so all the more reason we should do most of our business in the outdoors. Uh, Regarding direct contact and, and formites, there is still not direct evidence yet, even though people talk about the virus lasting for hours in plastic and steel and all that stuff, there is no direct evidence that um, um, uh, it can, it can, the con direct contact and formites can transmit 
and uh, and contact in the, sometimes some contact investigations have, have pointed a possibility that maybe elevators and restrooms could be the source but nobody has has efficiently isolated live virus from these places so it is if at all if it is it's a very inefficient mode of transmission direct uh, contact and fomites vertical transmission rarely occurs there are few case reports of igm positivity and uh, nasopharyngeal swab positivity in very rare instance uh, there are no confirmed infants uh, uh, getting getting uh, covid uh, i just want to talk a bit about infective vaccine because we are picking up so much covid 19 but not all covid 19 are infective uh, this graph sort of explains this in a bit better way, right? And so uh, the patient's viral load goes up and then after a while it comes down, okay? But the, the way we, 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 how do we know the viral load goes up? We use a PCR test. We use a PCR test to find out. But actually the, the patient is only infectious for a short time. Rest of the time, the PCR is positive. He is not infectious. The only this part of the PCR is infectious. This part of the PCR is not infectious. So we we actually don't have a test that can tell us when is the patient infectious. So we have we have, we have to understand this part that we still don't have a test to diagnose infectious COVID. The PCR that we are picking up picks up both infectious COVID and post-infectious uh, COVID. And so it picks up both. And that, that puts us a bit of a spot. And so this the same thing, I'm explaining it in a, in a, in a different method is a meta-analysis, looked at all, all cases of infectivity and this is what they have summarized. What they have summarized is, is that the peak viral load in infectivity happens before you are symptomatic or on the day you get symptoms. Contact investigations have shown that uh, most people get infected by somebody who is within day five of illness. So if I've got COVID and I've reached day six of illness, we, we couldn't find, if, if somebody comes in contact with me only on day six of illness onwards, there is very low likelihood they're going to get infected. But if the same person comes in contact with me in the first five days of my illness, more likely they're going to get infected. So beyond day six, People, people think the uh, case control studies have shown that their people are not infected. Um, in in lab, lab data, beyond day 10, in people with mild disease, mild to moderate disease, beyond day 10, they couldn't find culturable virus. So uh, one, way of, one way of differentiating whether you have infectious COVID or non-infectious COVID is to do viral culture. If your viral culture is positive, that means you have infectious COVID. Your viral culture is negative, that means you've got uh, uh, non-infectious COVID. And so uh, beyond day 10, people have not cultured the virus in mild to moderate disease. Uh, uh, the longest duration people have cultured a virus is at day 20. This is for patients who got severe disease, severe disease or critical illness or immunocompromised host. In these group of people, the highest they have collected is day 20. So beyond 20, people have not cultured the virus. But of course, the, the virus can be present for beyond 20, 90 days. Uh, this is the one that I mentioned about non-infectious COVID. So uh, what about what about asymptomatic phase? This, the, the one that I mentioned is all about symptomatic patients. What about asymptomatic patients? So when somebody is asymptomatic, there could be two possibilities. They either persistently they're never symptomatic or they are pre-symptomatic so they are going to get symptoms a few days later okay so in the persistently asymptomatic transmission can occur but we think the transmission is less likely in the, than in the pre-symptomatic phase so in the persistently asymptomatic we think transmission will be less but we are we don't know when they are most infectious and so when we when we identify patients who are asymptomatic and we isolate them, we have no idea when they are most infectious. And, uh, and uh, we really don't know how to manage these persistently asymptomatic group of people. But if you are pre-symptomatic, 
40 to 70 percent of transmission occurs during pre-symptomatic period. And so before your symptom starts, there is about half. So if, let's say if I am going to get COVID uh, and, uh, and I, I, become, I, I become symptomatic, 50% um, of my purple, I, the people I transmit, I transmit when I don't have symptoms yet. That's the reason why I always wear a mask. The reason I wear a mask is because I know that I can transmit to many people before I get my symptoms. And so pre-symptomatic period, half of the people I'm going to transmit the disease, I transmit before I, know, I, I even knew I got COVID. Okay. And so uh, based on all this, we have sort of loosened our discharge criteria. So in symptomatic group of people, we now discharge them after 10 days. Uh, provided the symptoms have improved for at least 24 hours. In symptoms have improved for 24 hours, we discharge for 10 days. The asymptomatic group, we discharge them after 10 days or from the date of the test. Here, uh, in the symptomatic group, we go by symptoms. In the, in the asymptomatic group, we go by the test. Okay, so that's regarding some basics about the COVID and the infectivity. So let's look at clinical categories. So this is how we categorize COVID, right? We all know about it. Uh, category one, category two, category three, category two, category five. And uh, this is sort of a category that we initially came up with even before WHO and, uh, and came up with a classification. Uh, uh, we thought this will be easy for us to manage cases because this was very, very easy to uh, make, uh, uh, identify based on chest x-rays as well as based on um, oxygen requirement. So we can classify patients, you know, quite an easy way to manage uh, in, in in day to day practice. And then we classified category one to three as mild, category four and five as severe. So anybody requiring oxygen is called severe. Anybody not requiring oxygen is called mild. Supplemental oxygen is called mild. Right? Okay. Um, so this is the data. I think I think one of the things that um, the, the, uh, I, have to, I, have to, I have to congratulate all the, the ID units uh, for, for, for coming together despite the pandemic and working with CRC of the relevant hospitals and collect data that, that, that we sort of use now, right? And so we collected about uh, 5,800 in the first two waves, we collected data from 5,800 patients. And we know in the first two waves, not the current wave that uh, Sabah is going through, uh, we found that 50% of them were stage one and asymptomatic, 32% were stage two and 14% were stage three. And we also knew about 8% of them get severe disease. 8% of them get severe disease. So 92% of them get mild disease and 8% get severe disease. And we also knew that uh, about in the 8%, uh, this 8%, 4.5% of them came in very ill, came in very ill, while 3.5% were came in well and then turned ill uh, later in the hospital. So 3.5% turned ill while 4.5% uh, were ill right from the day one. And that's what we have before, before this particular surge, right? Um, but uh, based on, th th this is my experience because as you know, Klang Valley was uh, heavily affected in the first and second wave. This was my experience. And, uh, and with this experience, when I went to Tawau, uh, I, got a, I got a shock because um, the presentation was totally different. So uh, October 9th, 2020, I compared the patients in Tawau and Sungai Bulu. How are the patients in Tawau and Sungai Bulu to see what they looked like? So uh, uh, category one, we, we had 60% of our patients were category one in uh, Sungai Bulu, while in Tawau it was 27% were category one. 26% uh, were category two in Sungai Bulu, uh, similar number category two in both. 8.9% uh, were category three, that means they had pneumonia in Sungai Bulu, while 29% were category three in uh, uh, in Tawau. Uh, uh, category four, those who require oxygen, 3% were had requiring oxygen in, uh, in Sungai Bulu, where 14% require oxygen in Sungai Bulu, uh, in Tawau. 0.56% uh, required ICU care in Sungai Bulu, while 5% required ICU care in Tawau. And so it was, it was a totally different presentation. I think we should collect, uh, if we, we have to collect this data and look at it again. Uh, with, with regards to how COVID has changed that. And one of the reasons why we think it, this happened is because of this. There's a very nice pictorial graph that shows the whole COVID experience. Um, so as you can see here, when you get COVID, 
50 percent of them no symptoms 50 percent of have symptoms uh, many of them mild symptoms they never require ox uh, 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 very 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 few require hospital admission only 20 percent of them symptoms are severe enough to require hospital admission and so maybe maybe what 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 Tawa was seeing uh, or probably rest of Sabah was seeing is this part of the curve, this part of the graph. While I was seeing the whole whole graph, uh, maybe at least uh, this part of the graph. And so depending on which part of the graph you're seeing, the presentation looks different. The other reason why I presume uh, you are seeing, uh, Sabah was seeing a different profile was actually the age of the disease. In the first cohort, our median age was only 30 years. But at least I know in Tawau and Sampurna, the median age was 45 years. And so I, I, I don't know yet the median age for Sabah. And so again, the issues regarding the age. Every country you go, depending on the age of the people who get infected, the mortality rate and severity is different. Even so Malaysia is the same thing. Our mortality didn't go, go far away from this particular graph. Our mortality is very similar to this mortality. And so it all depends on who gets infected with COVID in that particular locality. Uh, so that's the classification that we use, uh, uh, category one, two, three, four, and five. And so now, based on the data that we've collected so far, we think we can also come up with a different kind of cat, uh, uh, classification. This is classification based on risk of deterioration, meaning if somebody comes to us very stable, very well. What is the risk that they will deteriorate? I think this 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 date this is useful for us to manage clinical management, uh, and so uh, that's why I'm, I'm referring back to the data that we collected. All the hospitals in the in, in Malaysia contributed to this particular data during the care, the first and the second wave uh, to come up with the data set. And this is what we have. We have we had 5,600 group of patients who we have the age, and it tells us that if you're 12 to 30 years of age, you come to us, you come stable. And nine, two, 2,400 came to us stable. Nine, nine of them deteriorated. And so the 0.36% deterioration rate. If the age group is 31 to 50, there's a 3% deterioration rate. If you're 51 to 70, you've got a 9% deterioration rate. And if you're 71 plus, one third of them will deteriorate. And that's the data that we have very much dependent on age. The next thing that we put up is, and so as you can see here, the, the place where it sort of cuts off is at 50, right? 50, the rates are quite high. And so we looked at it a bit differently. Again, uh, 5,000 group of patients, whether they had comorbids or no comorbids. Less than 50 without comorbids. There's a 0.96% deterioration rate. And so this particular group of people uh, do very well. Uh, uh, less than 50 without comorbids. Uh, less than 50, but you have co some comorbid, then the, the rate is higher, 5.51%. More than 50, but no comorbids, again, 6.167%. So fairly similar deterioration rates. But if you have more than 50 and you have comorbids, the deterioration is very high, 15% deterioration rate. And that sort of puts you... And so you can, you can actually have... A, 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 uh, sort of a risk ladder based on just this group of patients. So the lowest risk will be less than 50 with no comorbids. The next highest risk is uh, less than 50 with stable comorbids or 50 to 70 with, uh, with no comorbids. And so these two are similar. And if you have 50 to 70 and you have comorbids, you've got a higher risk. And if you are more than 70 years old, with or without comorbids, you've got the highest risk of deterioration. So it sort of tells you on admission, on admission. So this tells you if somebody comes to you stable, if you're unstable, you don't need a risk stratification tool. They're unstable. If they come to you stable, your age and comorbids gives you a very good idea what kind of groups are going to deteriorate. Okay. And then, so that's that's what we have put up here. So age less than more than 50, and then the comorbids, and, uh, the comorbids that are of importance to us is chronic kidney disease, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity, BMI more than 30, pulmonary disease, and diabetes. Uh, the others might be significant, but we don't have data for that. You know, but people use biologics in uh, like rheumatology patients who use biologics, transplant patients and patients on immunosuppression. 
uncontrolled HIV, likely high risk, but you don't have data for this. The biggest data is for this group of patients. And when do they deteriorate? They deteriorate between day five to day 10 of illness. How to predict their deterioration? In addition to risk factors, we also talk about warning signs. And I will try to tell you what these warning signs are, right? And the reason why we're using warning signs is we are trying to follow the dengue model, right? Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, we have 3.5% uh, uh, of the patients, 3.5% of the patients coming to us very stable, but then deteriorate. They go on to category four, category five. And we think those who deteriorate tend to have warning signs. So if you keep on monitoring for warning signs, you can pick up the group of people who are going to deteriorate. And that's why warning signs are extremely important. And what are these warning signs? Uh, we've got clinical warning signs, laboratory warning signs, and radi radiological warning signs. The clinical warning signs are persistent or new onset fever. Anybody has got persistent or new onset fever. Fever continues day three, day four, day five, day six, fever continues. Persistent symptoms, uh, day four, day five, you know, you're, you're supposed to get better, but you now still have cough. You still are not very well. You're still very lethargic. Then you, you are considered uh, a clinical warning signs. Somebody has got reduced level of consciousness, but it's not because of hypoglycemia, uremia, or something like that. Again, it's a warning sign. And then somebody you, you develops respiratory compromise, be it exertional dyspnea, exertional desaturation. What I mean by exertional desaturation means we ask the patient to sit and stand for one minute, and then we check the pulse oximeter. If the SpO2 drops more than 30, more than three percent, then we say there's exertional desaturation. People are tachypnic. SpO2 is less than 95% in room air. These are, all, these are all considered warning signs. Laboratory warning signs can be any one of these three. A rising CRP value or CRP value more than 50 milligrams per liter. Uh, a single CRP value more than 50. Uh, same like the age, more than 50. Dropping absolute lymphocyte count or single value less than one or, or thousand, whichever value you use. And then neutrophil lymphocyte ratio more than 3.13. Again, a laboratory warning sign. And of course, x-ray looks horrible or x-rays are worsening. Again, it's a, it's a warning sign. And uh, just to give you an example of using uh, NLR, we have data to back up, back up these, these statements. Um, so if you can see here, less than 50 and NLR is less than 3.13, the chance of deterioration is 1%. If less than 50 and the NLR is more than 3.13, the chance of deterioration is 2.69%. If it is more than 50 and less than 3.13, the chance of deterioration is 6.61. If you have more than 50 and NLR is less, more than 3.13, the chances of almost 24%. Again, showing that you know these warning signs, uh, warning signs along with age, along with age, gives us the idea who is going to deteriorate, who is not going to deteriorate, and these are the ones that you look for every day. And so this is the language. There's a, there's a COVID language that you should talk about. The same way we use dengue language. We talked about compensated shock, decompensated shock, warning signs. You have to talk the same language when you manage COVID. You should talk about warning signs. You should talk about uh, critical phase uh, and, 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 and you should talk about high risk groups. Okay, so that's regarding risk stratification, risk, risk stratification of COVID. And the risk stratification is very useful to design whether the patient stays in PKRC or comes to the hospital and how to manage them in PKRC. Uh, moving on to medical management of COVID. This is a natural history of COVID, right? Uh, uh, the patients comes up with, uh, initially there is an anti, there is a viral rest replication that happens in the early infection. So the viral, during the viral replication, they are asymptomatic or they are mild to moderate symptoms. Uh, I realized, especially in, in uh, when, I, when in Sabah, many patients comes to us with, with, with very severe illness. They tell us that, uh, you know, we ask them the duration of illness. They tell you, I was just sick yesterday, uh, you know, or two days, the onset of illness, just two days. It is because they completely miss this phase. Uh, they are oblivious of this phase because of maybe, maybe they are truly asymptomatic or they ignore these mild to moderate symptoms. And so they don't present, they present straight away in the pulmonary phase. In the pulmonary phase, there is viral replication still going on, but there is also immune response coming in. These are the patients who have pneumonia, they start having dyspnea, 
if you do a CT scan, they can see you can see ground glass opacities. When you do a chest X-ray, there are patchy or patchy ground glass opacities mainly in the peripheral region, uh, and uh, so these are the ones that are present. And in late stages, the there is no more viral response. Predominantly, the response is the host inflammatory response, where you see pneumonia, sepsis-like presentation, uh, respiratory failure, uh, ARDS. And cytokine storm. So these patients present like a severe bacterial pneumonia. You cannot differentiate them from a severe bacterial pneumonia or septicemia. They present very similarly. They don't have septicemia, but they look very similar. Uh, and so uh, uh, there is also that, that's that's the most common group of patients that you see. Severe presentation is this. There is predominant host inflammatory response. But we also have another profile. This is a profile that we see where what happens, the, 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 there is not much inflammatory response, but the comorbid medical condition becomes florid. So there are patients coming to us with APO. There are patients coming to us who are end-stage renal failure patients who are coming to us fluid overload. And so that's another profile of severe disease. So the one profile of severe disease is, is this patients coming to us with, with host inflammatory response, high CRPs, um, uh, fevers, and also another group of patients who come to us with their with their uh, cardiac failure getting worse, with their uh, with their end stage renal failure patients coming to us fluid overload. We have to learn to pick up these group of patients too. And so, given that given that that phase, you know, uh, a viral phase, early pulmonary phase, inflammatory phase, the treatment obviously has to be different. So, what you give for a viral phase cannot be the same for early pulmonary phase. What you give for early pulmonary phase may not be uh, uh, similar for the, may not be adequate for the inflammatory phase. And so we think, you know, in the early pulmonary phase, uh, early, early, in the early viral phase, you might have to give antivirals. In the, in the early, uh, in the pulmonary phase, you might have to give antiviral steroids and anticoagulants. And in hyperinflammatory phase, the, the role of, uh, antivirals become smaller and we should think of giving anti-inflammatory therapy and anticoagulants. And so uh, 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 somebody mentioned that, you know, skill in medicine consists in eminent degree in timing the remedies. And that's the reason why I feel many of the clinical studies in, in COVID don't come out very significant because uh, it is all about timing. Uh, a different treatment at a different time phase won't work. I think it's similar to dengue, you see. You can't run a colloid study uh, for uh, throughout the dengue phase and say colloid will never come back significant. But in a patient with compensated, decompensated shock, if you run colloid, colloid is useful. And so uh, many of the studies that come up come come don't look at the timing, the remedies, and the reason why we, we are unable to use many of these clinical studies that coming out, clinical research that is coming out for treatment because they don't time the remedies. So, so, unfortunately, so based on this, unfortunately, our treatment guidelines, a lot of it is based on expert opinion rather than evidence-based. And so our current treatment guideline says uh, for category one, category two, we don't treat these patients, but we ask to look for warning signs. Uh, but we do, we do recommend favipravir as, a, as, a, as an antiviral uh, to treat people who have got more than 50 years of old with comorbids. So even if they, are, they have a pneumonia, we want to treat them. More than 50 years old comorbid, because I showed you earlier, this group, the chance of deterioration is very high and, uh, and we want to treat them during the viral phase, uh, at least during the pulmonary phase. Uh, we also want to treat end stage renal failure patients early because they deteriorate very badly. Unfortunately, we don't have a drug that is, uh, that is useful in these situations. And so that's why we mentioned here, you need to consult ID physician the choice of treatment. And of course, anybody who's got a warning sign, we should consider them for antiviral treatment, uh, provided the treatment is early. In late, in late inflammatory, uh, on the hyperinflammatory phase, of course, the antivirals may not be very useful. And so the dose of treatment that we are recommending is 1,800 milligrams uh, BD for one day was followed by 800 milligrams uh, BD for five days. We are capping the treatment for five days because um, um, we, we, we think uh, there is a study in Remdesivir comparing five days and 10 days and five days was similar. 
we are we are saying that in the hyper inflammatory phase antivirals will not be very useful uh, remember favipravir is teratogenic and so it is it is contraindicated in um, in child bearing women and also in men whose partner is child bearing and so but if you have to use it we have to remind patients that um, for the next 7 days after stopping favipravir they have to use contraception so favipravir lasts in the system only for 7 days and so after stopping favipravir for the next 7 days they should use contraception it is contraindicated in gfr less than 30 ml per minute but there are case series case studies showing that in end stage renal failure patient regular dialysis you could use the same dose so uh, so if you if you have an end stage renal failure patients you should consult an id physician who will who will weigh the pros and cons and decide whether he wants to treat with favipravir the common side effects are hyperuricemia diarrhea elevated transaminases and neutropenia so we should watch out for the hyperuricemia we should watch out for it the drug interaction that you remember if you're using paracetamol only maximum 3 grams is allowed for 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 theophylline uh, you should um, 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 theophylline increases favipravir levels and watch out if you're using pyrazinamide because both pyrazinamide and favipravir can cause hyperuricemia uh, the next treatment that we have we have we have mentioned is about anticoagulants and so our proposal is anybody who requires supplemental oxygen category 4 use uh, use um, um, uh, the the prophylaxis dose of uh, 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 of co of uh, of low molecular weight heparin so i'll give you enoxaparin as an example use 30 to 40 mg daily uh, if in icu patients so we don't use based on d dimers in icu patients we use high prophylactic dose for example if you use Okay, in oxaparin clexane we are suggesting 0.5 mg per kg 12 hourly um, we have a short threshold to use treatment treatment doses of enoxaparin that is 1 mg per kg 12 hourly in anybody who has got confirmed uh, venous thromboembolism uh, pes or if you find lot of clotting in the vascular devices we recommend using uh, full dose anticoagulation so that's the Uh, where we we place our favi our antivirals this is where we place our anticoagulants uh, in addition we also have some tricks up our sleeve to manage our category 4 patients we tend to uh, uh, our category 4 patients we 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 force we, we ask them to have complete rest in bed we teach them self proning we even give them urinals so that they can rest in bed and we also effectively manage the diarrhea by using lopramide Uh, so that the need to go to oxygen is toilet in fact we have got some portable oxygen and we even give them portable oxygen when they need to go to the toilet because we think if they exert too much there is a lot more there than the negative there is a increase uh, uh, negative intrathoracic pressure the negative in increase intra negative thoracic pressure worsens the 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 uh, the the ground glass opacities in the lung and so uh, this this is something that we learned from the chinese and we do uh, force our category 4 patients to be completely rest in bed and also reminder to check all patients that you start on covid uh, please go to the website this website to look for drug interactions because we might miss some of these drug interactions okay uh, the most controversial thing that i just want to talk about will be anti inflammatory therapy and this is something that we are still grappling on we really not sure how to manage these cases right okay so this is a recovery study uh, that told us that uh, you know uh, probably the only study that that uh, showed mortality benefit significantly is uh, uh, they used 6 mg daily of uh, dexa for 10 days and they were able to show that uh, you know in mechanically ventilated patient uh, the, they could bring down uh, mortality by about uh, 35% and in people who have got supplemental oxygen the category 4 patients they able to bring down the mortality by 20% um, but in those people who did not require supplemental oxygen category 1 2 3 uh, there was no benefit in fact there is some uh, indication that this could be harmful right and so in mechanically ventilated patient mortality reduced from 40 to 28% on supplemental oxygen mortality reduced to 25 20% but remember there is still high mortality this kind of mortality we cannot manage and so dexa 6 mg daily alone is not going to cut it 
because DEXA 6 gram daily brought down the mortality, but there is still significant residual mortality that is that is that is that is happening, right? So I'll give you an example of this particular case that I saw from in Tawau. Uh, this is a 62 year old male diabetes, so 62 year old with diabetes, and so uh, uh, high high mortality uh, uh, combination comes to hospital Sampurna on the 2nd of October. Uh, the patient started having symptoms since the 26th of, uh, uh, of September. So cough, fever, one week, SOB already five days. On arrival, uh, his SpO2 is 70% uh, is on room air, 70% on room air. And he, in high flow mass, they reach 98%. They intubate him in Sampurna hospital, right? And so, um, uh, and uh, as you can see, his ALC is 1.3. His white cell count is 7.5. And so uh, he's intubated, sent to Tawau. Tawau, they, meant, they, they start him on uh, favipravir. They give him flexate. They give him dexamethasone, uh, six milligrams. Uh, they use, they exactly use two divided doses. And so, so they, have, they have followed uh, uh, the, 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 the guidelines from, uh, from most, uh, most, um, uh, uh, most, most, um, most, um, international bodies, right? So they're given antiviral. Yeah, we don't have remdesivir, but they gave favipravir. They gave clexate. They also gave uh, um, um, a dexamethasone in the dose that's provided. And so this patient does, does for a while, extubated in, on the sixth, um, um, uh, change to nasal prong, but then gets upgraded to face mask and then requires high flow nasal cannula. By then he's already five days on dexamethasone Favipravir and Flexane. And uh, they already upgraded the antibiotic to Miropenem. But now he's back. So this is what you see. So he comes with a ferritin of 2,800. Uh, CRP is 109. Uh, it is, uh, and the next day, it goes up to, CRP goes up to 211. Uh, and ferritin for 4,000. As you know, he gets started on, um, uh, started on um, dexamethasone. His CRP comes down 152, 658, gets extubated. Here on the 6th, he gets extubated. But then CRP starts going up again. And then he gets high flow nasal cannula again. So these are the patients um, uh, that, that, that we don't know uh, what to do. Our guidelines in, in, uh, that we have, the studies that has been done so far, as, is not preparing us for, for cases like this. And so, so based on very much, you know, uh, expert uh, p uh, opinion and, and, and lessons that we learned from, from Sabah mainly, uh, the ID physicians have come up with these recommendations. Um, uh, having said, having, having, having to say that we don't have uh, trial evidence to back up these recommendations. So we are saying start everybody on six milligrams of either IV oral or, or, or uh, uh, IV um, um, for five to 10 days. Uh, but in patients who present severe disease, what do we mean by severe disease is uh, those requiring high flow mask or ventilation uh, and, and they have high inflammatory markers. So this, these are the ones that we think are in hyperinflammatory phase. The hyperinflammatory phase, uh, we are recommending don't use just six milligrams. It's not good enough. You might have to give eight to 12 milligrams of dexamethasone. Or, or if you want, if you want something equivalent to one to two milligrams per kilogram daily of methylprednisolone, you start with such high dose and then taper down. So, uh, so it can be either eight to 12 milligrams of, uh, of dexamethasone, or it can be methylprednisolone, 100 to 150 milligrams of methylprednisolone, uh, either of those two, if patients come to you directly with severe disease. Um, so just to remind you, uh, one milligram of methylpred uh, is 0 0.2 milligrams, so five times. And so if it's 80 milligrams of, uh, of DEXA, that is equivalent to uh, about um, um, eight times five, 40 milligrams of, uh, of, um, of, um, of methylprednisolone. Um, so in the case that I showed you from Sampurna earlier, you start them on six milligrams daily, but, but patients continues to worsen uh, with, with inflammatory markers increasing suggest double the dose. Instead of six milligrams, you could go up to 12 milligrams of, of dexamethasone. And once patient improves, you, you can taper it. Uh, 
and I mentioned earlier regarding the methylprednisolone, and so 100 to 150 milligrams of methylprednisolone. Uh, the duration tapering of dosage in patients got mild disease, even five days of dexa is enough. So if steroids can be stopped 48 to 70 hours after, after the patient has responded clinically with reducing CRPs. But in severe cases, if you stop, stop within five days or so, we, we, we have seen uh, rebounds. And so in severe cases, you have to gradually taper the steroids over two to three weeks, guided by the degree of hypoxia and CRP. And I mentioned earlier, these are all experts' opinion rather than based on evidence. And we need to work it. We need to now do clinical trials on these protocols and see whether we're on the right track or not. Um, uh, so that's that's regarding uh, patients deteriorating. Um, but and the inflammatory markers are going up. Uh, this is a study that, that looked at uh, again corticosteroids, and they, they looked at the patients who received corticosteroids and they found something interesting. They found patients with CRP levels more than 20, there was a very benefit, about 80% reduction in mortality or mechanical ventilation. But if the CRP levels are less than 10, there's a steroid actually made the person's worse. There's an increased risk of mortality or mechanical ventilation, uh, two times uh, higher risk of uh, uh, doing worse outcome. And so, so it looks like while, while, while dexamethasone or any steroid for that matter works in the hyperinflammatory phase and patients who are not in the hyperinflammatory phase or inflammatory phase uh, as evidence with CRP less than 10 uh, steroids may not be useful. And so maybe there is another profile of patients. Uh, so I mentioned uh, two profile of patients earlier. One profile of patients, the one that go into pulmonary phase with increased inflammatory markers and a hyperinflammatory phase with the inflammatory markers reaching the levels of sepsis. There's another profile of patients where the underlying disease worsens, the cardiac failure worsens, the, the end-stage renal failure patients, the fluid overload worsens, but, but, but COVID itself is not very severe. So that's another profile. Probably there's, an, there's a third profile of patients where the patients who cannot control their viruses and their viruses really goes, causes a viral pneumonia. And so these patients worsen without increasing in CRP, without increasing in ferritin. And these patients, we still don't know how to treat because we, these patients will already be on favipravir uh, right from day one. And uh, we know uh, our, our, our antivirals are not, are not really the game changer. We don't have a powerful antiviral yet. Uh, and so, and these are the places where we are wondering whether convalescent plasma might be useful in these situations. And again, this is something that we need to study more. And so with that, I thank you. And I just want to let you know, uh, just to remind you that whatever you're seeing now, um, uh, I know the case in, uh, in Sabah coming down, just to remind that this is not even the beginning of the end. Rather, this is the end of the beginning. We now need to realize we have a long road ahead of us uh, with regards to COVID. Given that there's a long road ahead of us, I just have, I just have a few messages for, 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 for you, right? Message number one. Um, given learning, learning that uh, the that COVID has got such diverse presentation, we have changed our case definition. Uh, our case definition is very, fairly liberal now. Uh, if fever, any of these symptoms, any of these symptoms, if you have any two, any two, you fulfill the clinical criteria for COVID uh, testing, um, or, or more severe disease like cough, shortness of breath or if somebody has loss of smell or loss of taste, again, you can test them for COVID. Anybody present to our hospitals with severe respiratory illness, again, you can, press, you can, test, for, you can test for COVID, provided they have attended an uh, event or, 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 or with, with a co known COVID cluster or from red zones. So, so, all of, so one of the way of deciding uh, what is this is any place where there's MCO, or, or enhanced um, 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 movement control order. Again, these people are eligible for that for testing. And so, please test more. Uh, be it in primary care, be it in be it in your hospitals. Test more any patient that fulfills case definition for COVID, because 
we, without testing more, we won't pick up more. Um, the second thing I want to, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to explain is we we cannot be using so much hospital space for COVID um, because uh, we need we need the hospital to manage other diseases too, and so we need to maximize our usage of PKRC uh, in our hospital. We have to learn to use our PKRC better, and so based on the data currently, age less than 50, uh, no comorbids, ADL independent and who don't have ongoing need for hemodialysis, we might have to use PKRC. We need to put up good protocols in PKRC to pick up warning signs so that we can identify these group of people, the 3.5% of the patients who will deteriorate and then transfer them back to hospitals. Uh, but we need to use PKRC better and uh, maximize them so that most patients are in PKRC and not in hospitals. The third one I need to mention is we need to decrease healthcare worker infections. Uh, in Sabah now, uh, based on the current data, 38% of the healthcare workers are infected from the community. 33% of the healthcare workers are infected from other healthcare workers and only 4% are infected from the patients. And so it really tells you what you need to do to decrease healthcare worker infections. You need to practice what you preach uh, outside the hospital. Uh, uh, and number two, we need to really want, remember it is just not patients that are, that, are, that we are going to get COVID from. We are going to get from each other. And, and so, uh, and the rule, uh, these rules apply not only to the public, to us too. So the best way to decrease the risk is to make sure all of us are masked and, and also to make sure we avoid uh, confined spaces uh, and, and, and remember in pantry where we cannot where, where we cannot do this in a pantry, we really have to make sure we, pro, we, we have social distancing and good ventilation in our pantries. Uh, preach uh, what uh, practice what we preach. And the last message to you to all of you is this. Remember this is a pandemic and it is not going to be easy. We are all going to be stretched. So uh, don't be uh, uh, sort of don't be uh, cry babies and and and, and just uh, man up and let's let's just do it and we are all going to be stretched we are all going to have sleepless nights we just have to man it up because this is a pandemic I can't imagine people telling us that you know in the Great Depression or World War Two or World War Three they had easy life easy for them I'm sure they were stretched and we are all going to be stretched. And we'll have to be prepared for it. The second message is think out of the box for solutions. This is a pandemic, this is something unheard of. And so we are going to go back to traditional solutions and we are not going to go very far. So always think out of the box for solutions. And remember, it can also be an opportunity to solve some of our perennial problems. And so use this as an opportunity to solve some of your perennial problems. And the last thing to succeed we need to adopt a whole hospital approach. It is not an ID unit approach. It is not a medical department approach. It has to be a whole hospital approach, meaning the emergency departments, the bed management units, everybody should come together and manage this. Uh, and also it has to be a whole MOH approach. I, 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 the, the reason I'm saying that is because I, 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 it, it can be, there is so many barriers between public health and hospital that we have. And we should break all those barriers and say yeah. it's a whole MOH approach. Your problem is my problem and my problem is your problem. And in addition to MOH, it has to be a whole government approach. So don't try to manage problems purely within MOH. You need to take the whole government, you need to be able to galvanize the whole government for your approach. And so stuff like logistics and all the stuff, clinical medical management has to be MOH. We, nobody else can do other than us. But logistics, transport, all that can be beyond MOH. Controlling the disease, controlling the disease, controlling the spread of the disease has to be a whole government approach. I get disappointed when, when Ministry of Health colleagues uh, blame Ministry of Health when the disease goes out of control. Disease going out of control cannot be MOH alone. Just the way dengue, when dengue spreads, when mosquito breeding is is goes out of control. It cannot be MOH that can control dengue spread. Similarly, it cannot be Ministry of Health 
that is going to control uh, COVID spread. It has to be a whole government approach. And uh, that's all I have for you. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Suresh, for the you know, ex excellent talk, as usual, and, and, and enlightening um, and inspiring last words. Um, hopefully, everybody could sort of um, take it to heart and, um, and as Dr. Suresh said, uh, man up and get everybody involved in, in, in the, the trenches of things.